Good morning, everyone, or in the afternoon, the East Coast. My name is Chris Gellert. I'm a physical therapist and a personal trainer and CEO of Pinnacle Training Consulting Systems. I'm working with Pain Care Labs today and offering this wonderful dynamic webinar, which is getting in shape with running and all that involves the running. So we're going to talk a little bit about getting in shape with running, how to start with running, sneakers, a little bit of programming, and really some exercises and some understanding some injuries that can happen with running and how VibraCool product can be a great resource to help with pain and overcome dysfunction that you may have. So running is really easy to do. It doesn't require a lot. It's relatively inexpensive. And it's relatively simple to begin. All you need is some effort, some chutzpah, some sneakers, and a place to go and begin. It's only one form of exercise. There's obviously walking, there's yoga, there is Pilates, there is weight training or resistance training, there's swimming. So there's a plethora of things to do to get in shape. I'm on vacation right now and in Hawaii, and I'm seeing a lot of people running here. And it's crazy how many people are running where I thought people would be more bicycling or walking or doing something similar. But besides the case, or that be it may, on the East Coast or wherever you are, running is something that I see all, all the time. People running, and as a physical therapist, I see many patients with running injuries. And we'll talk a little more about that this morning or today. So getting started. The big question is, have you ever run before? And the thing about running before is if you've never run, then obviously it's a good point to get started slowly and easily and very gentle and progressive. Where do you begin? You begin with knowledge, you begin with education, and you begin with starting um, a plan. And the plan begins really with walking first. So starting a walking program should be about three times a week, progress accordingly, because you're going to build up your endurance. So you need a plan. If you're looking to get in shape or you're looking to get fit or you're trying to prepare for a race, that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So what are your goals? Running doesn't involve a lot of time. A running can involve, you know, if you're doing a 10-minute mile, 10 minutes to run a mile, 30 minutes to run three miles, if you're running a 10 minute mile. So in the bigger picture, running is not much of a commitment and does not involve a big income or a big, I should say a big, not a big income, but a big amount of money to, to invest. Where will you run? Places to go around your house, start with regular the road, uh, maybe trails or grass on golf courses. And maybe it's good to find a running buddy. A running buddy can be someone that can keep you accountable and keep you on track to make it more fun. So something to think about. How often you run, again, goes back to how much time you have, your goals and the progression or periodization that we call it to getting in shape and tying it into an exercise regime, or plan. First, in getting started, you need a nice pair of running shoes. So where do you go? Well, you need to go to a running store. Here on the East Coast, or where I live in the East Coast, there's a place called Marathon Sports, a great company in Massachusetts. So you may have that in Georgia, you may have that in California, you may have that wherever you are, but you need a running store and go to a running store and spend time with someone who really knows the foot and get the right kind and type of shoes and sneakers for the level of exercise that you're planning on doing. So if your goal is to run a just around the area, around where you live, you may get something less expensive than a really high level running shoe, which would be used for 5Ks, 10Ks, 15Ks, or even marathon running. So 
you've got to make that decision. What are you going to do? What do you want to do? Right? The shoe should fit perfect. There should be a nice fit on the in the instep uh, and the rear and the forefoot or the front of the foot. If it's too loose, you're going to have blisters. If it's too tight, you're going to have blisters. If it's just right, it's going to be perfect. So when getting sneakers for running, two fingers, you should have a, a fit behind two fingers, but firm. If it's sloppy or moves too much, then that's going to create a little bit of obviously instability in the ankle. And if it's too tight, then your toes are going to jam into the beginning or front of the, of the sneaker. So just like anything else, the running shoe should fit nice and perfect. There are many shoes on the market. There's a lot of options. I've just put here uh, three. Brooks is a good running shoe, very affordable. You've got Nike Air or Nike on the right, and then you've got Asics. All of them are built different, but similarly, meaning the way they're constructed, their design, what their function is. Uh, Nike's tend to be a little more stiffer in the rear foot, the back of the foot, um, and ASICs tend to give a little more. But again, try them on. Definitely experiment and see how they feel in the running store. Now, I'm just talking for a minute about walking shoes. Walking shoes, you can see, are extremely different. The anatomy of a walking shoe is that it's built more sturdy more rigid, as you can see here on the right, compared to the ones here, they're more giving, they're gonna flex more, they're gonna be able to absorb more stress and load. So walking shoes are different than running shoes. They're built different and they fit different. The walking shoe has, again, the rear foot, which is the back, the midfoot, which is the center where the white is, and the forefoot, which is the front. But the outsole, this picture on the bottom left, in the midsole where the heel counter is, is really tend to be stiffer. So that every time you come down, your heel, your calcaneus, your heel bone comes down and absorbs steps two and then through. Steps two, steps through. The tongue should be comfortable. The insole should be comfortable. There'd be usually laces. Velcro is typically uh, someone who has maybe diabetes or diabetic neuropathy. So there's some shoes out there that are for diabetics. We'll take a look at them and you can Google them or search them. The running shoe anatomy or anatomy of the running shoe, you can see there's typically gel in the rear or gel cushioning. That's the rear foot. And the midsole has a buffer or the support. And that's also called the midfoot or midsole. And the forefoot or the front of the shoe, that's called the insole. So that's again more absorbing of every time when the come the foot hits the ground. But when the foot hits the ground, it should be heel to toe, heel to toe, heel to toe, not toe to heel. Because if it's toe to heel, you're going to create shin splints, which is pain in the front of the shin. Again, the running shoe should be comfortable with the tongue, the laces, and the toe box. That's in the front of the shoe. Some running shoes I've seen have zippers. I don't know how I feel about zippers, but I'd say laces are best. You can make it as comfortable or as snug as much as you want. Whereas with a zipper, you can't really adjust that accordingly. And again, the heel collar or cuff, that's the rear. That's right around the Achilles should be firm, should be comfortable and shouldn't be rubbing when you're running. It should be just there for support, which protects your Achilles and the back of your Achilles tendon, which is the back of the, of the calf, which connects to your foot. That's called the Achilles tendon. So beginning jogging versus running, there's a big difference. Is there a difference? There is. Jogging is an aerobic exercise where you go about a pace less than six miles an hour. It's less intense. It's slower and takes up less effort than running. So there's less rise up in the knees. 
There's not as much arm swing and it can be done by young and old. The benefits include weight control, strengthening of the muscles in the heart and bones, social interaction and confidence. Comparatively to running, running is an aerobic exercise again, where you're faster than six miles an hour, usually in the seven to 7.5. Jogging is around four to 4.5 miles an hour and walking, walking speed is usually three to 3.3 miles an hour. These are all clinical numbers that I've learned in school and according to American College of Sports Medicine. Running is also a higher intensity and de demands more exercise and energy from our body and more effort. That means from the lungs, from the heart, from the muscles. So here in running, knees raise up, arms are swing more comfortable compared to jogging. Running is typically not suitable for all people of ages because if someone has significant knee pain or osteoarthritis, jogging might be more comfortable and less compression on the knee joint. Matter of fact, if someone has severe osteoarthritis or knee replacement, I wouldn't be jogging and running. I advise them to, to walk and walk can be a great exercise and to keep active with, with walking and playing other sports. Another benefit of running is that benefits include losing weight, strength in the heart, cardiovascularly speaking. And again, it's gonna help achieve more of a fitter body or fit body. So getting started with jogging, jogging should be about five to 10 minutes, increasing jogging time and or distance, then change your form to actually using more arm swing to increase arm swing. So there's relatively no arm swing with jogging, arm swing and running, which will increase your stride and your push off or your propulsion, which is your form. The body should be relaxed, head should be relaxed, straight upright and relatively upright back, relaxed, arms bent, hands in light fists, not overly gripped, light fists, light, hips forward, and again, that efficient arm swing and stride with the foot landing with the midfoot in the heel. Again, getting increasing your distance one time a week initially, then to maximum of two, three times a week. The reason why you do want to do a max of two, three times a week is you want to avoid overuse injuries. Overuse injuries are injuries that develop such as stress fractures, plantar fasciitis, shin splints, Achilles tendonitis. So there are many ways to avoid overuse injuries. One of them is not to increase your mileage too fast or too quickly. Listen to your body. If you have discomfort, your body should stop or rest or to maybe take some time off. You wanna incorporate flexibility such as yoga or stretching post exercise, which is really important and take time off from running. Don't run every day, which we just talked about. So to avoid blistering as well. So what is an overuse injury? An overuse injury is in term that is used to describe an injury that occurs from tissue damage resulting from repetitive demand over a period of time, over and over and over. You need to give your body a chance to recover between workouts. So if you run on Monday, you need at least 24 to 40 hours of rest before doing it again. So maybe like Wednesday. You can see in this picture, the person holding their knee, they're probably developing some quad tendonitis. It's very possible. So after you run, there's so much evidence, evidence-based speaking, 
the importance of stretching. So I get asked all the time, should I stretch before I run or after run? Always after you run. The tissue is more warm. It's more blood flow. There's more circulation. You can warm up by walking in place, doing jumping jacks, arm swings, you know, step touch to warm up the body. But you really don't want to stretch before you run. You want to stretch after you run. Here are four different stretches that I want to show you and have you try or practice on your own. First is called a quadricep stretch. Try to keep your knees as close together as possible. Pull your heel towards your buttocks. Hold it for 15 seconds, repeating three times on the left, three times on the right. So the quadriceps is the front of the thigh. The low lunge stretch is also known as a hip flexor stretch, is a stretch for the hip flexors. So the hip flexors attach from the hip into the lumbar spine. That you want to go straight down, same thing, hold 15 seconds, repeat three times on both sides. Then you've got a hamstring stretch. This person is extremely flexible. So lying on your back, you can use a strap, maybe a dog leash, a towel or bathrobe. Works great. That's for the back of the thigh called the hamstring. And finally, ITB and stretch, which is reaching to the side, crossing one leg over. So the IT band connects from the hip to the knee. That's another area that can become very tight and a possible site of injury or inflammation. So some important tips. As I said earlier, maximum run one to three times a week. If you run more, this will lead to ovaries injuries. It's important to change your running shoes every 500 miles or every six months. This is information from several podiatrists I've worked with, sports physios I've worked with, and is really the norm in the industry. And this is if you're doing consistent running and running miles and miles and miles that you're going to change. So it might be a little longer if you're doing light jogging and they may last longer. So as a rule of thumb. Another important tip, change your running route often. Don't run the same route over and over again. Mix it up. You're going to vary the terrain, vary the load, vary the stressors. Stretch, stretch, and stretch every time you run. Every time. Not before, but after. It's important to cross-train with yoga or Pilates. Yoga is more ten, tend to be more for uh, relieving stress, but it's a great exercise to cross-train. And Pilates is more for core strengthening. but Again, implement those with your program. Really, really effective. Incorporate weight training twice a week. Weight training can be doing some shoulder press, doing some arms, doing some rows, working on glutes and hamstrings by doing lunges, backward lunge, forward lunge, diagonal lunge. So you don't need a lot of weight. You don't need a lot of equipment to build up strength and then increase your repetitions, which will build up for endurance. I can't stress enough the importance of recovery. Recovery meaning active recovery and passive recovery. Active recovery, drinking water, stretching, diet or food, hydrating with food, not hydrating with food, but hydrating and then eating food, carbohydrates, protein, and passive recovery. That could be listening to music, meditation, recovery, um, compression socks can be very effective to flush out lactic acid. So there's something you can do if you're a professional athlete, look into recovery systems such as, such as those, like Normatec. So active recovery, stretching improves elasticity of the muscle, decreases muscle soreness, result, resulting in reduced tightness, and it feels good. Hydrate, again, water to restore homeostasis, which is the body's natural balance. Take in some protein and carbs, which means to refuel. And if you're having pain, stop. Don't run if you're having pain that lasts more than three days. Ice, not heat, 
the pain area. So let's say the person's having, or you're having, or know someone's having pain in their knee. Ice the knee, whether it be below the knee or above the knee, for three days. It's important to keep moving, like walking or maybe riding the bike, but decrease the compression forces, such as running or jumping or plyometrics. Then use heat for three to four days and resume stretching. If the pain continues after that, you need to see a physio or your physician for some help. But I have some more advice as well to you. Before I share the advice, there's two common running injuries. One called the iliotibial band syndrome or ITB. The second is also called runner's knee. What's the difference? There's a big difference. So with ITB, you can see the band connects from the hip bone all the way down to the knee bone. It's thinner by the bottom of the knee. So more injuries occur by the bottom of the knee versus the hip where it's thicker and wider. And it's made of connective tissue, water, proteoglycans, different elements that keep the elasticity and pliability there and strength. Pain usually throbbing initially, then an ache along outside of the knee. The pain may spread and it may be or focal in nature. So very specific on the actual outer knee. Classic is it symptoms are complaints hurting going upstairs, up and down stairs, getting in out of bed is a classic symptom of ITB syndrome. The repetitive friction of the connective tissue that attaches from the knee and the hip becomes inflamed and irritated. This leads to local pain at both the outside of the knee and possibly the hip where the tissue connects. This may turn into bursitis, but it typically is called ITB syndrome. Whereas knee tendonitis or runner's knee, pain develops below the knee, the kneecap, which is the patellar tendon because repeated compression forces loads and friction over and over and over again. This repeated load, compression stimulates and activates pain fibers. Pain fibers are also called nociceptors. So when pain develops with maybe some redness and warmth, typically within that green area. Pain is typically and usually throbbing, then turns to an ache throughout the knee. Usually again, it's below the knee. You can also have quad tendonitis, which is the tendon above the knee, but most pain in the knee from running develops with below the knee and it's called peripatellar tendonitis or patellar tendonitis or runner's knee. So the pain tends to be focal. It may spread. It may go down or just stay concentrated. Again, hurts climbing stairs, getting out of bed, but definitely any kind of walking and loading it bothers the knee. And how we differentiate is the location of pain. If it's right focally on the knee, below the knee, that's again going to be more that peripatellar or runner's knee. Whereas if it's on the outer and the IT band is really tight and painful, that's going to be more of an ITB syndrome. And there's a couple other tests we use. So some symptoms, again, are, are some causes, I should say, of developing ITB syndrome and knee tennis are increasing the distance or frequency too quickly. So going from one mile to six miles or from 5K to a marathon. Improper support, you need good sneakers. Overdoing it, running more than three times a week. Lack of stretching or tight thigh muscles over cross training, over doing too much weights and not enough stretching and cross training as a whole. So what do we do physical therapy wise? And I recommend all patients and people for acute zero to seven days, zero to three, stop running, ice and rest. From three to seven days, use heat and gentle stretch stretching the IT band, stretching the quad, and stretching the hip flexors. Use VibraCool. 
VibraCool is an amazing product. What is VibraCool? VibraCool, as you can see here, is a small little device. It's not a TENS unit, but it's actually a device that has mechanical stimulation that overrides and really tricks the pain fibers. So the stimulation is a higher amplitude than that of TENS. You can use it anywhere on your body. And you, the cool thing about it is that you can apply ice pack right behind it. Turn it on and that's all you do. So you can apply it on your knee, you can apply it on your elbow, apply it on your shoulder, apply it on your hip. So this mechanical stimulation overrides these pain fibers, calming them down. Because those pain fibers go up the spinal cord of the brain and they go down on the spinal cord tract. It's like an input, output, input, output. It's based on the gate control theory, which states that the gate control theory of pain, it asserts that non-painful input closes the nerve's gates to painful input, which prevents pain sensation from traveling to the central nervous system. That's the spinal cord. The gate control theory describes how non-painful sensations can override and reduce painful sensation. You can see here, if someone hit their hand with a hammer, the A delta and C fibers go up the spinal cord, that's ascending to the brain, and goes down the motor track, affecting the parchini corpuscles and those nociceptors. So sensory going in, motor going out. In the subacute stage, it's important to continue to stretch, walk, possibly use a stationary bike to flush out irritation. Continue with heat and stretching, maybe even a heating pad. If pain continues on more than 21 days, you really want to still use VibraCool and use walking. So again, VibraCool, what is it? VibraCool reduces inflammation using high frequency stimulation with focal muscle vibration, which increases blood flow to accelerate tissue healing. It works. I've used it. It's easy to use. The instructions are on the box and they're included as well as how to set it up and use the VibraCool product. Remember, you don't wanna use this more for 10 or 15 minutes. So once you turn it on, 10 to 15 is your dosage or your time. It's affordable. I believe now Pain Care Labs is selling this for $59.95. It used to be $89.95, but check with Pain Care Labs today for finding out the cost. It's portable. It fits in the palm of your hand. Literally, you could take it with you for travel or home or recovery and pain without needing an outlet. Nothing like a, a, a plug or a cord that you need. So it's so easy to use. Literally, all you do is open up the package, unwrap the neoprene sleeve, place the little vibration device inside the neoprene sleeve, put the Velcro together, place the ice pack behind the neoprene sleeve, and then put it on the injured area, whether it be your elbow or your shoulder, or for those runners out there, it would be obviously the knee or the IT band, which would be the outside of the knee or below the knee, and turn it on. Turn the machine on and watch it for about 10 to 15 minutes. That's all you got to do. If your pain still doesn't go away after using the VibraCool product, continue using the VibraCool product, but see a physical therapist or call your doctor to get therapy because you need some help. It's been my pleasure talking today about VibraCool in Pain Care Labs. If anyone has any questions, I'd like to entertain them now. Does anyone have any questions? I got a question from Nicole. Often when I go to running stores, they try to sell me custom insoles. Do these really help? That's a great question, Nicole. I think they do work, but depends on your type of foot. So if you're a pronator, which means if your foot collapses, you do need support. You need support for your arch to come up. If you're a high arch, it's called pes cavus, then you need a supportive shoe that has them built already in there. So you don't need additional insoles. So 
Most people are neutral or slightly supinators. I'm a pronator, which is my arch collapses. So I don't run, but I have insoles and customized orthotics in my shoes. I also have pairs of Nikes that have support in the midfoot, in the middle of the foot, which is called the midfoot. Again, compared to someone who has a high arch, which again is called pes cavus. So they don't need the insoles. I think the Dr. Scholl's insoles, those for $10 are very, very ineffective. Or the number ones you can go to a store and pick out your number that are sold on TV. I think they do not work. The Cole and the idea and optimally is go to a running store and get fitted properly. Does that make sense? That's what you want to do. Your feet will be happy. You'll be happy. The kinetic chain will be happy. So your, your ankle affects the knee, affects the hip, affects the spine of the back. So it's a kinetic chain. It's all connected. We want mobility in the ankle, stability in the knee, mobility in the hip, and stability in the lumbar. Great question. Any other questions I could answer? Yes, yeah, Sarah, great question. Is there a difference between kinetic warm-ups and static warm-ups running? So I kind of covered it earlier. So when you say kinetic, it's really the whole chain, but you're referring more to dynamic warm-ups versus static warm-ups. So a static warm-up would be doing something just standing in place and stretching, whereas using your arms, jumping jacks, hip flexion or marching would be more of a dynamic warm-up or doing hip rotators where you see a lot of these athletes bringing their hip out and bringing it in, bringing out, bringing in, that's a dynamic warm up. Every professional athlete or a lot of professional teams, especially um, in the Massachusetts region, you know, the Patriots and the Celtics and probably the soccer, the regular revolution team, and probably even the Red Sox as any professional team does dynamic warm ups more than static warm ups because it's more functional. But again, most of us aren't professional athletes, so we don't do a lot of dynamic warm-ups. We want to do something simple. But for those runners out there, that's what you want to do. You want to do something static, maybe first, um, but particularly dynamic. It's more functional. Stretch afterwards versus before. Any other questions? What do you think about the thick insoles for both short and distance runners? Some athletes here get some quads or hamstring issues with thick insole shoes. That's a great question. So what do I think about, think about thick insole shoes for both short and distance runners? Um, I think there's a place for those. And I think there's a place for those, but those are shoes like Hoka or Hoka, H-O-K-A. Um, I haven't tried them. I think there's a place for those. But again, if you're short or a long distance runner, you should look at the type of foot you have, the goals you're trying to do and, and how much you've done, keeping a log of how much you're running and look at what shoe fits the best and doesn't move around, isn't sloppy or isn't overly tight. As I indicated, if it's overly tight, your toes are going to jam into the front of the foot and that's going to cause pain. And if it's loose, you can possibly twist your ankle. And the key thing to avoid hamstring and quad injuries is again, heel to toe, heel to toe, heel to toe in terms of running, but also stretching post exercise, post running. And thirdly, working three sets to two sets of hamstrings to quads. I'll repeat that. Three sets of hamstrings to two sets of, ham, uh, to two sets of quads for strengthening. The reason why the three to ratio is researched by the NSCA National Strength Conditioning Association has looked at the muscle biopsies and shown that the hamstrings are weaker biomechanically. So three sets of hamstrings to two sets of quads. Any other questions? Anybody else? Well, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. If you have any questions, you can email ptcg1990 at verizon.net. I'd be happy to respond back to you. Also, I want to recommend Pain Care Labs and the Vibracool product. It works. I'm not just saying that. I've used it. 
And thirdly, they have a, a version for children called Buzzy, which is another product out there as well. But go check out Pain Care Labs. They have all the things you need and check out their YouTube channel and look at their products today. Have a great afternoon. Good morning, aloha. Have a good day now.